Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome on this fall morning, where I find it comfortable, but apparently a number of you are finding it chilly. There are announcements in your bulletins. I ask you to look at those on your own. Uh, most of them are repeats. I would also note, though, that next Sunday is Koinonia after the service, and you're going to be starting a new book called Hearing the Message of Daniel, Sustaining Faith in Today's World. So <clears throat> I encourage you to join. Uh, they're only, they only meet for what, like 45 minutes? 45 minutes to an hour. So... And it's right after church, so you guys haven't gone anywhere yet. Um, I just encourage you to do that. Are there any other announcements that we need to make at this time? Um, I have to say something on this uh, service we're going to lead next week. The, we're having the meal at the community center. Community center. And I reached out to someone to see if they need help because they, they're all the same. You know, kind of back we are. Who's the member? But they feel they're catering the meal again. But they thought they might, might need some help with desserts. But they're going to talk, call me later on in the week. Well, I'm going to call Sue. Yeah, I'll also here. And said, you know, they need help working. Yeah, all right. Self. Right. Uh, but they thought they had that covered, I think. But I don't know for sure. But anyway, I just wanted you to know that, that some of my, some of you might get called. Uh, that's fine and the funeral itself is at 10.30 so huh? I said and the funeral itself is at 10.30 a.m. Right, right, right. and viewing is Friday so yeah. Uh, but it'll be a big one so yeah. yeah well if there are no other announcements then let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship today as we listen to the prelude, Song of Hope.
please stand as you are able and join in the responsive call to worship. Come, share the joy of the Lord. Delight in God's goodness. Praise God who gives each person a special gift to be nurtured and shared. Lord, we thank you for these gifts. Come, let us worship God who entrusts us with so much. Lord, make us worthy of your love and trust in us. Amen. Let us join now in our welcoming hymn number 372, My Shepherd Will Supply My Need. be seated. Now please turn in your responsive reading books to number 94. This is titled Mission and is taken from Romans 10, Acts 17, and John 3. Let us read responsively. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But how shall they ask him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them unless someone sends him? That is what the scriptures are talking about when they say, How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace with God and bring glad tidings of good things. In other words, how welcome are those who come preaching God's good news. God made the world and everything in it. And since he is Lord of heaven and earth, he doesn't live in man-made temples. And human hands can't minister to his needs, for he has no needs. He himself gives life and breath to everything, and satisfies every need there is. He created all the people of the world from one man, Adam, and 
scattered the nations across the face of the earth. He decided beforehand which should rise and fall and when. He determined their boundaries. His purpose in all of this is that they should seek after God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and are. As one of your own poets says it, we are the sons of God. If this is true, we shouldn't think of God as an idol made by men from gold or silver or worship from stone. God tolerated man's past ignorance about these things, but now he commands everyone to put away idols and worship only him. For he we have set a day for justly judging the world by the man he has appointed, and has pointed him out by bringing him back to life again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that anyone who believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God did not send his Son into the world to condemn, but to save it. We long to live as God's people, yet in the very depths of our lives, we know how we have hurt those around us, through words and actions, as well as from indifference. But God hears us when we call and answers with the grace we need. Let us pray together as we confess our lives to God using the unison prayer in the bulletin and then coming silently before the Father. Let us pray. We keep slamming into walls, O merciful God, when we are left to our own devices. Throughout our faith history, your Son offered words of healing and hope to people who lived in darkness. In the brilliant light of his love, people grew and flourished. But now, Lord, we find that this world dominates our lives. We are troubled, angry, and fearful. We want to see your presence in the world, but we spend far too much time looking for the big picture rather than seeing the myriad of ways in which your love and healing power is shown. Forgive us when we grow impatient with you and with the course of things in our lives. Heal our wounds and put us back on pathways of peace and service. Enable us to speak your words of hope in this darkened world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. God gifts us with steadfast love and abundant grace. We can accept these gifts confident that the God who loves us is faithful and forgiving. As God's forgiven people, we can live into the hope of everlasting life today and every day. Amen. seated. Now as we come to the time of hearing God's word, please join me in the unison prayer for illumination. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from Romans 15 verses 22 to 33 and is found on page 1768 in your pew Bibles. 
Paul has made it clear in the previous verses that his ambition is to preach Christ where people have not heard the gospel before, rather than, as he put it, building on someone else's foundation. But this does not mean he is intent on doing ministry without the help of others. He asks for the Christians in Rome to, quote, join in his struggle by praying for him. And when he finally gets to visit them to Rome, in Rome, he hopes they will assist him on his journey to Spain, presumably by helping fund his travels. Romans 15, 22 to 23. This is why I have often been hindered from coming to you. But now that there is no more place for me to work in these regions, and since I have been longing for many years to visit you, I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I have enjoyed your company for a while. Now, however, I am on my way to Jerusalem in the service of the Lord's people there. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the Lord's people in Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them their material blessings. So after I have completed this task and have made sure that they have received this contribution, I will go to Spain and visit you on the way. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. I urge you, brothers and sisters, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to join me in my struggle by praying to God for me. Pray that I may be kept safe from the unbelievers in Judea, and that the contribution I take to Jerusalem may be favorably received by the Lord's people there, so that I may come to you with joy by God's will and in your company be refreshed. The God of peace be with you all. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as we close out on chapter 15 today, there are some that actually feel that this is pretty much the end of the letter, though we'll go into 16 and discuss some of that later. But it finishes with a rather definite doxology. And... I want to talk about today, last time, last week, we talked about the world, mission, the opportunity for mission in the world, and some different ways in which we might be able to contribute to that on a small scale and impacting a larger scale. This is Paul's referencing to his own ministry now as well. And his ministry was very practical. Uh, it always involved three things. First, it involved planning for the future. Second, it involved uh, fulfilling past commitments. So, and then we'll get to the third a little later. But Paul was planning for his future. He was already planning to go to Spain. Now, he knew the dangers that were there in Jerusalem. He had been warned multiple times that he would not be received extremely well. And in fact, there is... In Acts 15, an example of when he went to Jerusalem and had counsel with the apostles that were there. 
That's part of why he says uh, in verse... I'm sorry. 31, that his service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints. He knows that the people there not being fond of him, he's afraid they might reject this gift because of their pride. Gifts that he's painstakingly collected as he went on his missionary journey from various churches. And he did that because he promised them when he saw them back in Acts 15 that he would be helping with them because of the famine that they've been having and the pressure that had been put upon them by the Jews and the Romans alike in Jerusalem. You know, we talk a lot about the future in every church I've been in, pretty much, both as a pastor and as a lay person. But it seems like we don't actually shape the future. Instead, we, we almost, it's like we think that God gives his orders while we're moving, or we just go with the flow. That Christian life is sort of going on automatic pilot here in the church. And you just float around. Paul did not live like that. He saw life starting, he saw life ending for himself, for churches. He spoke of that fact, that he would be content no matter what, and for him to live is Christ and to die is gain. For many years he had longed to go to Spain, and he was planning to do so. Now, I want to note, didn't pan out. God had a different plan. But that doesn't mean the time that he spent on it was wasted. That doesn't mean that the hope and the yearning that he had to do so was pointless. It gave him a drive, the drive to continue forward. I think that's part of what helped him to be so complete in his fulfilling of his past commitment to those Jews in Jerusalem, to those Christians, excuse me, in Jerusalem. He wanted to make sure that one thing was done before he got and took off on the next big journey. You know, Paul had four missionary journeys, and... Sometimes there was as much as 10 years between them while he was awaiting on God's call, but he was always looking for and planning for when God would give his call. A lot of times, we in America in particular are drawn to new things, flashy things. This is exciting, so let's do this. It's been said that in a number of polls that actually many of the millennial generation long for something more traditional and secure, which is kind of interesting. It's not what you would expect. So we want to make sure that we plan ahead as best we can. We want to make sure that we complete whatever the tasks are that are required for that as we move step by step. We want to make sure 
in this particular case, he talks a lot about money. That the offerings are there for this church to carry on some of its ministries. And we do have them. He gives us the principle of sharing in verse 27. For if the Gentiles have shared in the Jews' spiritual blessings, they owe it to the Jews to share with them in their material blessings. If somebody blesses you spiritually, and the only way you can thank him is with material things, then do it. Because that's God's program. Now there may be other ways that you can bless them. And you can thank them. And those are totally valid. He then says, once he's completed that task, that's when he'll go to Spain. And he's going to visit the Romans on the way. So he's trusting in the power of God. In verse 29, he says, I know that when I come to you, I will come in the full measure of the blessing of Christ. He counted on God to come through. But there was a practical aspect to that as well for the Romans to remember. And those are in verses 30 through 33. He entreats the Romans to join him in his struggle through prayer. Now I urge you, brethren, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. So he is asking and even expecting as he prepares to head into dangers both known and unknown for them to pray. He's recognized his need for intercessory prayer support from believers. Now he asked for this again and again in his various letters. We often view prayer as a time for comfort, reflection, making our requests known to God, sometimes for sleeping. <laughs> But prayer is often a struggle. Satan and your fallen nature resist intercessory prayer. Why? Because prayer is an offensive and defensive weapon, both in our fight against Satan. And so it can involve wrestling before the throne of grace that the evil designs of men and demons may be thwarted. You know, there was an illustration that I saw that I cannot remember completely, but I remember the essence to it. There was some missionaries who went on mission to a new area, and they were camping that night outside of a village and they met with the villagers the next day and they asked the villagers did you have any thoughts about attacking us while we were out there that night and they said yeah we even gathered to do it because you shouldn't be here said, but when we did, there was 47 guys with swords that were surrounding your camp. Now, they got in contact with the home, with the pastor of their home church a little bit later, and they mentioned this story to that man, to the pastor. And he said, really, what night was that? And they gave him the date. And he said, wow. He said, that day, we gathered to pray for you and your mission. And there were 47 men who were praying <coughs> at that time. Prayer is a struggle. 
the Greek word that is translated as strive is derived from the word from which we get the word agonize. It's not easy when you strive. He's asking for passionate, fervent prayer because he knew the danger that awaited him in Jerusalem. I mean, people in every city on his journey have warned him, you're headed for real problems in Jerusalem. And the urging to strive in prayer is motivated and empowered by Jesus and the love of the Spirit. This love is what the Spirit imparts and maintains to the faithful. So Paul entreats the Romans to join him, to strive together with him in his struggle through prayer. A Christian's intercession is a means of sharing in the ministry of others. We pray every Sunday and we have intercessory prayer. And at the beginning of that time of prayer, I almost always say, whether you know the person or not, personally, pray for them by name because God hears and God knows them and God knows their situation and God will help. To, he will answer the prayers in the way that he wills. It's not just empty words. It can be difficult praying for somebody you don't know or a situation that you don't know about. You may be uncomfortable doing that. I know sometimes I am. So, you know, because we tend to have this attitude, well, if I don't know them, how does it impact me? Why should I care? It's the way a lot of the world is today. But we must always remember that they are either our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ having been saved by the blood of Jesus, or they're people who are in need of being saved by Jesus Christ through His blood on the cross. In either case, they're valuable to God. For, as the re our thing this morning said, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. We need to help others to believe. And for those that believe, we need to help strengthen that belief. We do that <coughs> through prayer. We also need to be willing to ask for it. And I've noted that before. We find that difficult, particularly in the culture out here in the Midwest. They're too embarrassed to expose their needs to others. Or they hold back from making such requests because others have used prayer requests selfishly to focus attention on their needs. And you don't want to be a bother. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Be a bother. Not just to me, but to each other. Never be afraid to ask for help. Prayer, as Paul realized, is both a privilege and a responsibility. We have the privilege of going before the Father. Jesus opened the way for us. Giving Him our pleas and knowing they'll be heard. We have the responsibility to pray for ourselves and for each other. For those that are in need as an expression of our love and care and concern. I mean, Jesus also told us to pray, so if you want to obey, then 
that's there too. But really, prayer is all about care. Prayer is really all about compassion. Prayer is all about sharing a little bit of your life with someone else. Whether you're asking for prayer or giving prayer. I mean, Paul knew that he attributed his success in ministry to God's grace, but he also knew that it was affected by the prayers of others. And he gives specific guidelines for their prayer. He prays that he may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea. The translation that was read, I believe, said unbelievers. These were folks who had it in for him, mostly Jews in Jerusalem. After all, the disobedient had forced his departure from the city before when he was there in Acts 9. Then he also requested prayer that the believers in Jerusalem might accept him and his service. They were aware that Paul was preaching to the Gentiles. And if you remember, I had spoken over the last couple of weeks about that rift that was there between the Jews and the Gentiles. The ethnic wall. And how Jesus came to break down that wall. <coughs> And his apostles were taught the same. But that doesn't mean that everybody listened. It's amazing how stubborn some of us can be in changing our worldview and our perspective on life. Maybe that's something that needs prayer. He prays that the believers might accept his service, that is his ministry. And he is very concerned about the unity between the churches and their believers. He doesn't want these kind of separations. You know, elsewhere, like in Galatians, he says, there will be no slave, nor free, nor Jew, nor Greek, nor male, nor female, but we're all one in Christ. This is the unity that he was speaking of. Hopefully this offering he was bringing that he had collected would be accepted, because if it was spurned or received with only casual thanks, then hurt feelings could erupt. I mean, how would you feel if you prepared a gift for someone and they said, oh, cool, thanks, and then just turned away? Or even worse, if they said, I don't need that, you just keep it. These days we don't do that. We talk about re-gifting. because you don't want to hurt the other person's feelings. But isn't it still the same thing? Because they always find out about the regifting. And they think to themselves, well, didn't I give that to them? And, and now they're not passing it forward, they're just passing it on to someone else. There's a difference between paying it forward and just passing it on. He wants the offering to be delivered and distributed properly. If you remember from Acts 6 in Jerusalem, there were problems with the distribution to the poor and the widows. That's why they started forming deacons in the church to take care of that. So he has these specific things that he wants them to pray for. Not as a mere formality, but as a passionate, fervent prayer that can bring concrete results.
this detailing of his hopes and dreams that's here at the end of this epistle is really an opening of Paul sharing his own self. Now, he's done that previously. He shared some of his struggles. He shared some of his frustrations through the various parts of the epistle. But now he's sharing something even more private for most of us, our hopes and dreams. What is it that we really want for our future in life in the church. We need to be vulnerable and share that. Because people that don't know that can't help you. And it's a sure thing that you're not going to get it all done on your own. Or if it manages to get done, it's not going to be done as well as it could be. The last thing I want to point out is that when he planned on coming to the Romans, he said, I hope to come to you in joy by the will of God and find refreshing rest in your company. So this time that he was going to spend with the Romans was going to be a good time. Yes, he had his plans for the future. Yes, he had his mission that he would have just completed in Jerusalem. But he wanted to take that time before he went off on the next stage to be refreshed with people he'd never met in person. And yet he trusted them to provide that kind of environment, to provide that kind of respite. And he wants it in their company. He doesn't want them just catering to him. He wants them to be relaxed and refreshed as well. And overall, there would be joy. Joy in the presence of a brother or sister in Christ. A welcome that comes from the heart. Churches really don't do that very well today. Churches aren't very good at inviting other people on the whole. Churches, apparently, from what I read in an article in churchleaders.com, aren't very good at reaching out to folks that stopped coming after the pandemic. Those people that don't come say that for them they realize that they really didn't need the worship to feel close to God. Now, that's a problem on their part because they're wrong about that. Worship as an aggregate, as a larger group, is very much desired and strengthens your faith. But it also has to do with how they feel about being a part of that church, whatever church it may be. Paul finishes with the blessing of now the God of peace be with you all. And that peace, again, is not no conflict. It's shalom. It's that desire for wholeness, completeness, serenity, assurance that can only come from God. We don't have anybody going to Spain or Jerusalem or Rome. And that's okay. We have our own ministries that we do here locally as outreach and just to show caring. Pray for each other in those endeavors. 
See where you might be able to help. Find joy in being with each other. And take rest, peace in each other's company. And may the God of peace be with all of you through those times. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would turn with me to number 375, we can sing, Anywhere with Jesus I can safely go. Jesus is with us. Jesus and the Father have a plan for us. And they give us what we need for that plan. We should be thankful to God and give thanks to Him. It is fitting that we take time to do that right now during worship. And then think about how we might give to others so that they can be blessed as well. Let us meditate as we hear Pamela play, Be Thou My Vision.
Please join me in our unison prayer of dedication. Sweet Savior, your word is greater to us than gold, even great gold. May these gifts brought today be a gesture of our gratitude for the riches of your word given to us. Multiply these gifts and make them like the drippings of the honeycomb to those in need. Amen. Please be seated. As I noted earlier, there's people's names that are in your bulletin. And I ask you to take this home with you. Pray for the people that are listed on there, whether you know them or not. And let's come before God in prayer. God, Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks and praise. You are an awesome God. Lord, you know us so well and you love us so much. We really can't get a hold of either, not in its completeness. We can't accept it. We can rely on it. We can trust in it. That you will never do evil to us that you will always make things work to good according to your will and plan for us. It doesn't mean there are no struggles, no trials. Those teach us, strengthen us, and hopefully draw us together as one body as we lift each other up to support those in their individual trials. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling with personal problems who have really wandered away from your will and your way. Lord, help us to bring them back. Or put people in their lives if they're not within our reach. We pray that you would put people in their lives that would be able to do so. To remind them not only of who they are, but whose they are. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this beautiful church. And we thank you for the people who work unknown, unannounced, to help keep it beautiful. Lord, we pray for those who are in service to you. Everyone serves in their own way, but there are some who are called to be teachers and preachers. Lord, care for them and bless them. The burnout rate just keeps growing. The harvesters, the workers in the field grow fewer. Lord, may you be glorified in an ever greater way. We pray that that situation in Israel would be used by you to show your glory. We pray for those folks, those that have lost family or friends there, and for the tensions that exist. Lord, help them to stop focusing on each other and begin to focus on you. There can be peace. Shalom. It may take Christ coming back again, 
And Jesus, we pray that you do so. Making every knee bow and every tongue confess your Lord as you set things right in the world. But we don't know when that is. And so while we trust in you, we ask that your Spirit who is within us would give us wisdom to know and understand. To make plans for the future as well as care for the present. That you would give us courage and heart that we might step out in faith, trusting you, reaching out to others, both near and far, within the congregation and without, and that we might have perseverance, for this is a dark world, and one that is not very favorable to Christians. Lord, may we glorify you through what we do, that we hear those words, well done, my good and faithful servant. And Holy Spirit, as we are one body in the church, be poured out upon this body. May it be a light in the darkness of this world. May we who are a part of it be little beacons of joy and of hope that share your love, your grace, your mercy with others as they hear the gospel, the good news of Christ, and help them to respond. Open their eyes, Lord that together then we may give you praise and glory. For we ask this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the same we taught his disciples when praying to say, oops, we're going to sing it, we're not going to say it. standing and join me in singing number 538 Lily of the Valley
Now may you go forth from this place recharged and renewed, ready to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, sharing the good news of the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ with all whom you meet. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen. Thank you.